lot of the successes we've been seeing, at least in the popular media around AI, have been around certain types of game playing tasks and a lot of image recognition, a lot of structured problems. We can look at the picture and we know what the answer is. And actually that's a little bit, in the marketing, kind of harder in a way because they're much more uncertain. We don't know beforehand actually if one of the actions we take or different marketing interventions, whether they're going to be effective or not. So we actually face much noisier problems, a little bit different on some dimensions. What's the old Chinese curse saying, may you live in interesting times? These are really interesting times for analytics. With machine learning and the combination of machine learning and analytics, there's no limit to what we can do. But on the other hand, we do have a limitation in form of a GDPR coming up. That can shape things to go in all directions. And it's a very, very chaotic time for us at the moment. Uh, you have clients who are looking for consultancies and agencies for their advice. You have consultancies and agencies who are looking at platform vendors for their advice. You have platform vendors who are looking at legal people for their advice. And all the legal people are looking at orally for advice. So there's a whole Russian doll situation <laughs> where no one really knows what's, what's happening. It's important for people in the industry to understand that there is a lot of lobbying going on and that they have to be careful about the discourse about lobbying and reality. If you have questions, reach out, don't hesitate, have conversations about it and be careful where your information comes from. My main fears are miscommunication, misunderstanding, which brings to escalation. And this is something we do not want because the risk is big. Especially in the United States where we are so focused on commerce, we are so focused on things that help business rather than things that help citizens. Being on the U.S. side of things, it's very interesting because we don't hear as much about it there, and yet we are subject to the same implications. And yet it's such a huge topic in Europe and really all around the world. It's something that really needs to be top of mind for everybody in our industry, especially the big players like Google. The challenge coming from Australia is that we're so far away, for one, but people don't necessarily think it's that big of a deal or it's not relevant or it's too costly but trying to get Australian companies on board with understanding how are we going to set ourselves up. I mean, those are conversations we're still having and this is rolling out in May. So, I, personally, from my own perspective, I'm really interested to see kind of how Europe does go and how our industry moves in implementing some changes around GDPR. GDPR, gonna cost your job. Going to jail, going to jail. Browser fingerprint, going to jail. All right vendors upon whom companies rely to handle their data, to have the whole marketing, technology stack, all these tags, that they aren't really stepping up to be um, as transparent as, as they need to be in terms of how things are handled. Obviously we need to talk about it and be compliant and things like that, but I'm not convinced we're the, like, the prime targets for it. I think if you're like a ad serving company or Facebook or Google, that, that, that kind of thing. I mean, the Euro, you know, everyone's really quite worried about these big tech companies changing the world we live in at the moment. It's the kind of, they're the kind of primary targets for this kind of thing. I don't think it's as much towards first party analytics. I think first party analytics are much easier to handle, especially in terms of GDPR compliance, as opposed to the all tags and, and marketing and remarketing tags. I think it's only the first part of a, of a, of a process that we will now uh, see happen. Um, I think we need international coordination because it's not only an EU uh, issue, it's a global issue. It's going to put a cost on what I think is sort of has been maybe this idea that we're going to collect everything first and then we'll figure it out later. I've always felt that that's a poor strategy, it's a poor data strategy. And now that, now that there's a real cost to collecting information, you know, improve our ability to be much more thoughtful about what we're going to collect because everything we collect is going to have a cost to it. And so now we're just going to have to have an argument for why we should collect it. 
personally, I think that the industry needs a shakeup. I think that we have been doing things the same way too many times, and it's, you know, things are changing, we're starting to get there, we're starting to get to the convergence of technology, but I, I welcome it. I personally welcome it, because I want to see some change and I want to see some new innovation happening. It makes you think about, there, even though it, the data was always perceived as being free in a way, there's actually always been this cost because you have it, there's been expectations around it that aren't often met, and now it's just going to force the entire organization to, to sit down and have a real data strategy and think about why are we collecting this, what is it going to be worth to us in expectation, what's the infrastructure and the systems that we're going to build around it in order for this to actually be effective for us because we're going to have to spend some resources to making sure it's okay for us to collect this and maintain it. It's just, you know, it's, it's never really been a free good, but we've been free riding, I think. The industry has been a bit of a free rider with respect to data. I see a big future in the digital analytics industry in simply cloud computing, collecting our own data, managing our own data pipelines, and move, being less tool-specific requirements, having raw data, de-aggregated data, or, either, or not even de-aggregated, but pure raw data. Some of the tools that we're used to working with and how they work today are going to work a little bit differently because of those regulations that are coming out. So I think that's going to be really interesting. And then on the other hand, another big takeaway I took from this conference is that everyone is demanding access to the raw data behind the platforms that they're using, like Adobe and Google Analytics. So I expect there to be even more discussions next year on different use cases of taking the actual raw data and then connecting it to other systems and really trying to make it actionable. Maybe we need to reevaluate what data we are collecting, how we are collecting, collecting it smarter and being really strategic with what we define how to collect and how we use it. It's really this decision making at the margin, like what's the marginal value of this set of data versus now the cost of, of owning it. And it's, it's related to this idea of technical debt. So currently we always incur a lot of technical debt because we do something very easy, which is just collect everything with some sort of tag and then we'll figure it out later. And I think what this is really saying is that the cost, or GDPR is gonna make the cost of holding that debt expensive. And so now we're gonna to wanna to spend a little bit more time up front really thinking about it. We've been doing a lot of things on volume. We'll have to start doing things smarter. It means that our data quality is gonna improve. That's gotta be a good thing, right? And the responsibility for business owners, for data processors, to acknowledge and disclose data breaches sooner rather than later, rather than hide it and, and be secretive and be just evil, right? There, there is a compulsion, there is a legal responsibility to act responsibly, measure and market responsibly. I think I said that back in 2015, even more relevant now. No, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to demonstrate that you're doing the right thing. It's that competitive advantage of being honest, open and transparent. This is something I see with my clients. The more they try to be more transparent, they, the more they are transparent, the less friction the user feels, the more trust the user feels. Competing on privacy is, I think, the next step. Again, this idea of governance and responsibility about what we're doing, which goes from being compliant with the GDPR today towards asking more philosophical questions about the future of our societies and democracy, discussions about fake news and how data influences political decisions, elections, um, is something that is reality today. Um, and we can of course say we are just a small part and we have no role to play in that. Or we can have some thoughts on this and maybe limit the data that we're using or encrypt or use pseudonymization. We, we have a toolbox, we can do things. GDPR is a necessary step. I think it's very important that we improve the protection of the consumer in a world where the data becomes more and more key to our lives actually. It's not just about a little bit of analysis or a monthly report anymore, it's actually influencing our lives. The other thing that I expect happening is other countries starting to adopt some of the same privacy regulations within, them, within their own countries. So as long as we're all accountable for what we do and we align Within the data ecosystem, I think we can build better quality data for the evolution of technology that's coming. Um, IoT, machine-to-machine -machine data transfers, it's there. 
Um, the only question is how are we going to adopt this as, as citizens, as consumers, and what are the consequences on our lives? And so we need to make sure to get that structure, that quality right, that governance, that accountability right. And that is what the GDPR is about today. It helps bring people, brings us, the business, the industry, to refocusing on the individual, the person, and their rights. And it'll help people be more efficient and they'll start thinking about, you know, do I really need to collect information and how much how much value will this information be in, in terms of informing a decision or automation? It's a good thing you have to plan uh, and design your application, design your websites, design your online interactions with privacy in mind, with respect of customer data in mind. So um, it's not a bad thing, but you have to plan for it. The tricky point is how GDPR will be interpreted in, in practice. So there's a massive potential of doing good not just good work, but actually doing good on the other end of this, if we get the chance. We will see what comes next after the GDPR. Let's work first on trying to implement this, make sure we agree on how this work within uh, agreed upon standards, for example. You know, I really think the next year, there's gonna be this tension between you know, building automated systems for marketing and GDPR, there's Article 22 of GDPR. And so I think we want to be cognizant of ultimately our job is to service people, right? We're all living here and, and as businesses and as analysts who are informing the business, ultimately it's to deliver value for people. That's really interesting to see how, how much limitations the GDPR will actually be once we start moving forward. I don't think that we will actually know until we see a lot of what happens come GDPR time in May, but I, I think it's, it's going to be an interesting problem for analysts to look at in terms of do they have all of the data they need now to be able to report, to be able to do a lot of the same things we're doing today. But it's not a perfectly baked cake yet, so depending on how that works out, the second iteration will learn from that. We've just reached the point now this week while we've been here at Super Week that there is more um, GDP, more gross domestic product, um, in data than there is in physical goods. So data traveling across borders is now worth more money than things like rice and soybeans and anything else. The future's bright, how can it not be? It's the most exciting space in digital and digital is one of the most exciting spaces in the world. We're in this middle intersection, it's a utopia. I see an in-housing, um, cycle at the moment where big brands are in housing to gain control of the data um, both as a, as, a, as a piece of information but also as an actual asset that they can capitalize on. So we've in Superweek we've had this very inspiring conversation about whether data should be considered part of the capital of a company or part of the labor from the people that generate the data. Users need these rights. They need to feel that the internet is democratic and free. And what's been happening with the way that data has been collected in a very, uh, very unruled, very um, uh, uncontrolled way is a bad thing for the democracy of people on the internet. It's a bad thing. And ultimately, why do we, why do we have GDPR? For the good of the consumer, for the good of the user, for the good of the rest of the internet. And then we apply machine learning, not so we can trick somebody into buying something that's rubbish, that's stupid, that old school thinking. No, it's all about doing the right thing for the right person at the right time. But there will be a very difficult period of um, convincing corporate lawyers that we need to spend resources and convincing corporate management that it's worth the effort. But from an ethics perspective, it's, it's a foregone conclusion. We have to move in this direction. It will be difficult. We have all known about actors that do that, that fall on cert, under certain practices that have short-term benefits but might, might not have long-term benefits for the industry. We all know them, we all have talked about them. So it's, I think it's time to clean up certain of these practices, again being more accountable. So it's the perfect time for it to happen. Is it going to uh, be difficult for us as analysts to work with? Yes. Is it going to make it seem like everything before GDPR was the good old days, probably. 
Is it going to mess things up for, the, for good? I don't know. But it's, it's a great thing for people and just like so much of what the EU has done, it's all in the interests of giving the rights back to the people that need them most. That can lead to more creativity and doing things in a better way that is secure and uh, really takes privacy into account. Yes, it might not be that we can do web analytics like we've always done it. We might not be able to track data in an easy way. Like the easy button might have gone. Like it's not no longer easy to do these things, but isn't that better? Is, doesn't that mean that there's room for new adoption? There's room for new things to come in, new forms of analysis, new forms of data collection. Wouldn't that be a better thing if we had to shake things up a little bit and try something new? If we had new players emerge? Do we want new players? Do we want new opportunities? Do we want to be able to have new things to analyze? Do we want new toys, new shiny things? I am very excited about the introduction of using programming, using Python, using R, using cloud technologies to get larger and broader and more detailed sets of data and actually doing much richer statistical operations on them, doing machine learning on them, which I, I see as being now a specialization that is you know, on the other end of the technical spectrum from uh, data collection, the, the tag management. So I've, I'm learning that I'm no longer, I'm not very excited about the data collection, but I'm really excited about what we can do with that, with that data. The cloud platforms that are out there, that has definitely expanded my mind um, in what you can do. Because, uh, I mean, just going from Excel to R was like amazing, but then going from R locally and Python locally to like in the cloud was just another sort of leap and um, it's just brought down the bar to doing amazing things and I really feel like it's people's ambition which is the only kind of limiting factor. I mean really literally now you could have a global database of stuff you know using you can really and you can scale to a billion users you know using the you know, your laptop at home and all this. A lot of the technology that's available today takes privacy very seriously, and you need that to trust putting your data in the cloud. So uh, I know Google Cloud really well, and one of their things as an example is, uh, most people don't know, Google actually built fiber between all of the different co uh, continents. So for their cloud application, like you can actually send data between countries and it'll never even touch the public internet. So um, having that ability to choose where your data is hosted, where it's stored, how, it, how it's actually transmitted uh, between different countries is already features that are built into many of these cloud applications. It's what's interesting when Christopher Ewald talked about building your own device graph. I think that that would be a pivot, right? The ability to really own the whole ecosystem as a company, um, including it being a graph as opposed to a cookie-based um, is one potential um, sort of direction that the industry might be forced to take. Um, although, more so than just being forced to take it, it makes sense. It, there's, you shared a lot of good reasons about why having your own device graph is preferable than relying on device graphs from Google, Facebook, or others. Analytics is going through a very big change at the moment. And we can define analytics as web-centric or web plus mobile-centric or web plus mobile plus in-store and behavior. That's one, I don't want to call it a threat, but that's a big change. I think the other big threat could be to say technology is changing exceptionally fast. So from the vendor perspective, there's a threat because a lot of these tools were built with technologies that were okay five or 10 years ago but technology is changing so fast that new technologies will change what we will expect from analytics very, very fast. There's so many, um, so many different data points, so many different variables and things that, um, you know, that doing a human won't be able to, to find what's significant in that, in that manner. So the, um, the machine learning and potentially artificial intelligence as, as something bigger, as a way to look at data and potentially understand and interpret. I think that's the intelligence part of it. Artificial intelligence and machine learning coming into marketing, wonderful opportunities and a bit of a risk. Um, so the opportunity is better tools, more interesting ways of dealing with data, uh, better ways of serving customers. The risks are so much more to learn, 
and more resources need to be spent. And those who do it better than we do represent a serious competitive risk. So that's, that's a danger. Um, but it represents job security because these tools are difficult, they're complex, and we as analysts are in the best position to understand them and figure out how to work them into the marketing environment and the analytics environment. And if that reminds us that what this industry really is, is understanding human behavior and explaining it to a human as behavior, that's only a good thing. But of course, on the flip side, there is gonna be societal effects of you know, folks losing their jobs. I know in the United States, there's some very large, it's in the millions of, of people who are employed in trucking. And the concern is a lot of those people will be displaced. And then so what does society do? So AI, I think, helps in automation, but I'm not so sure if the risk is AI per se, or it's really about automation. And AI or certain machine learning methods are making certain tasks that weren't um, amenable to being automated before now are. So I, I think that would be how I would think about it. But in terms of like Terminator, um, you know, I don't know. Like at, you know, just, be, just because we can figure out how to solve a game of Go, um, that's, that's, we're a long way off, if ever, from, from consciousness. There's always a hype risk that the, the wrong executives will read the wrong article and then they will just demand that we use these technologies without actually understanding where they fit and how to use them. So, and I think analysts have had to deal with that time and time again, that they get told, uh, you know, use this tool or use this technique as opposed to getting said, oh, here's, here's the problem that we're trying to solve. Does this technique or this tool actually, actually help us? Really understand the problems they're trying to solve and actually understand the environment in which they're trying to solve these problems. That's, that's the key thing. And then, and only then, should you start looking into what types of methods or what, what the solution is gonna to be to that problem. Because it's really gonna be dependent upon you know, exactly what you're trying to do. So I think it's a huge risk to just go and say, I want to use deep learning, let's say, or I want to use some AI technique, where can I use it? And that's kind of similar to saying, I want to learn how to use a saw, or I want to learn how to use a screwdriver or a hammer, and now where are the places I can use it? That's really the wrong way to get anything done. Machine learning uh, are uh, putting us on a track where you will need more math, where you will need more data savvy people to actually do uh, things to the data, to manipulate it, to find models, to, to make it speak. Not everyone can uh, do machine learning. I would encourage everyone to, uh, to read up on math. And so for me, for instance, I went into analytics after being a linguist. I now see myself learning more and more and more about you know, advanced stats, about how to process advanced math equations, because I know I'll, I'll be using it in, like, let's say, uh, like creating data models uh, using machine learning. So there's this whole education phase that could be an obstacle. So I think it's also a role for us to also tell the uh, government's education system to say, the jobs of the future are being determined now. If you don't know about advanced math, then you're going to have a very hard time going forward. Like the Danish government just yesterday launched a, a program saying that for the upcoming year they will be focusing on the Internet of Things and big data and basically all the stuff we're doing. So that actually being a central part of the governmental strategy, that just goes to show how much focus this is getting. We are moving from being a something for specialists on the side to actually becoming mainstream. It's going to be something that more people understand what we're doing and, and it's going to be understood on one hand with the GPR and GDPR talking about people's data on a higher level, making people aware that somebody's actually gathering this data and working with it. And on the other hand, the government actually going in and saying we should be doing more with, it, with this data. I do think there's, it's, it, there's almost a generational or a, or a a career generational thing so so my squarely in the middle of middle age I I think anybody in kind of my age de demographic who grew up in analytics um, needs to be figuring out what where they're pushing themselves because the uh, colleges universities and um, you know degree programs the the next generation coming up is coming out with a much broader and deeper set of skills and 
comfort with working with data, and those are the, the rock stars of tomorrow. The gap has widened between what's possible and what's actually being done. And that's the big challenge of the industry in a positive way, that we need to, to explain to the brands that they need to catch up. The consumer has already moved somewhere else, and the brand are still, brands are still stuck in the past, and it's our role in this industry to help the brands catch up with the consumer. That takes a lot of new skills, a lot of things that aren't. I exported data from Excel and built some really useful charts and knew some very, very basic statistics. So there's a little bit of fear that I have there, and I, I really am fearful for other people who are in my generation who want to just keep doing things the way they've always been doing them, because I think they're, they're going to be in for a really unpleasant surprise sometime in the next two to five years. I'm really curious to see what countries like China and India, which are virtually uh, quiet on our scene. I see, it's either me not getting interested enough in China and, and India, uh, but these guys have a huge reservoir of, uh, of talent. These guys have the brains, or potentially the brains, to, uh, to I don't know, revolutionize our industry, and uh, we haven't heard from them yet. So is it because they're still following the model of, let's say, Western Europe and, uh, and the US? Is it still a good model? I don't know. But I, I'm really hoping these guys have a different worldview. Uh, back in the day, you used to say that you know, China didn't really care about optimization because they were a closed market. So optimization? Yeah. Now that they're slowly adapting to capitalism, and they have, like, you have more vendors, you have more, uh, uh, more options for consumers to consume. Uh, there are also more options when it comes to digital. I mean, look at what, what's happening with Alibaba, for instance. So having a different mindset from, from these countries with huge populations, and, uh, uh, and there was a discussion about Asimov and what we call psychohistory, say, so how do you get models from the interactions of large groups of people? Uh, do countries like China and Pakistan and India with like super large population, are they able to give us insight on how they see their population going as large groups of people and have they found trends that can be useful to us too. Even if in Europe and the rest of the world we have smaller countries with smaller populations, can we apply their learnings to our countries? We have a huge problem in that we don't have a lot of women in the analytics field or we don't have as many as we should. But it's not just the analytics industry, it's throughout tech, it's throughout a lot of industries. But especially for analytics, I think oftentimes when it comes to more technical subjects, women are not thought of first. I would love to see more of them sharing more technical work and having the confidence to come and speak. I just want to, I guess, send a message to the women in our analytics community uh, to put your hand up, um, to try and get involved in things like this. Uh, you know, I'd love to see more women entering the golden punch card and competitions like that that are quite technical and I hope that it's gonna to continue to grow and, and really take off and lead to a lot more diversity and equality in our industry. There is an amazing parallel between the sophistication of the industry, as it is right now, and the topics that are being talked during this week. And really, is it, is it a correlation? No, it's a causation. It, there's a causal relationship between kicking your year off here in this industry and then what happens for the rest of the year. There's one more really important question, and uh, if the cameras are still rolling, can I have my beer back, please, Ollie? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers, buddy. Do you remember that first, the second Super Week? You finished, went downstairs to the bar, you grabbed one of these, and it's just the whole thing. I was like, whoo. Wow. You can feel it, it's tangible. I know who won, do you? I do. Oh. The Vikings won. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Vikings! Yay! Round of applause! Round of applause! Christine and Mark, Intelligent Prefetching!